we say that our life we were born and created
Nabi Muhammad was inviting the people to something to serve his own purpose. One of the things first uh, that's important I think for us to keep in mind in Motive and Nabi is to go back and take a look at Arabian society at the time that the Prophet was commissioned to save humanity. Arabia at that time was a backward society. Its only law was lawlessness. That was the law of the time. The society was rooted in who had might and power. And fighting and war was the norm. Brutality was their symbol. And warfare was their indoctrination. And vengeance and getting even for attacks and fighting was the way they lived. This was their normal lifestyle. There was no nothing called government in the Arabian Peninsula at that time. The only area in Arabia that even had a semblance of government structure was Yemen. With the king there, they had some semblance of governmental structure which gave some sobriety and normal, normalcy to life. But other than that, the nomadic tribes, the Bedouin, the nomads, they were roaming <coughs> and warring <coughs> and plundering and fighting. This, is, this was their norm. And here you have Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's born in this environment and he's been given the responsibility of reforming this society. This is an area, Arabia, that's a desert area, mountainous, the beautiful sky above. All of the nature in its splendor is there. And the Arabs at that time were fascinated with nature. But their problem was they, didn't, they couldn't make a link between the role and the power of a created world and what it meant to them with regard to how they should be related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, so the early Islamic period, which is referred to as the Meccan period, was a period, we call it the period of the esoteric period. A period when things appeared in many people's minds to be strange and hard to understand. What's the link between nature and human behavior and what role does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala play in this big scene? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is facing this fact that he's in the midst of a society that's backwards, that's uncivilized, that prides itself in warfare. There was nothing in Arabian society called ethics. In fact, any of the tribes that even attempted to show collective expressions of ethics and morality were considered as weak. So even if a tribes person or a clansman were to do something wrong, and obviously so, it was the responsibility of that clan or tribe to defend him or her against another person or tribe, even though his own tribe knew he was wrong. This is how backwards and violent the society was. The Arabs at that time, and some of the historians try to describe them in one scene and compare it to two other civilizations. The Greeks, for example, were known for their philosophy and science. The Chinese were known for their craftsmanship. And the Arabs were known for their poetry. But their poetry was not so tremendously great. Their poetry was essentially confined to five or six areas, and the five or six areas that their poetry was confined to was good in its own sense, but it was not a pervasive poetry that really would reflect all of the, the dynamism of life in the created world. They tended to focus on women, they focused on beauty, they focused on their pride and their boasting. They had a few areas that they had become, quote, experts in. But
but it was not the type of poetry that would, that would scan the broad scope of life at that time. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is dealing with a society that has this background. He himself, for, for example, his heart used, uh, used to be saddened by the backwards life in Mecca, in the Hijaz. Once the history says he saw a man who was gambling, and this man gambled away all of what he had, and he also lost his residency. He gambled it away. And this caused the Prophet ﷺ to leave Mecca, the city, and go to the suburbs. And he would ponder on all of these developments, which were aching his heart and bothering him. So I'm saying this to say that this is the background that he had to contend with in growing up and dispatching the responsibility of being in the deep. Now, when it comes to one, one of the things that I really wanted to mention tonight, but it requires for all of us here to do what I say to my students, a little AI. AI is my abbreviation for additional information. So normally when I assign something that can be read, I always tell the students you have to do a little AI, get a little additional more information about the subject because these subjects can't be exhausted in a 30-minute presentation for an hour or a day or a week or a month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, even in describing um, the reality, his reality, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if the Bahar, the seas and oceans, were like ink and inkwell, and you would try to write out the kalimat, meaning the expressions, the reality, the words, the ideas, the meanings of Allah, you would exhaust the ocean before you would finish, and you would need more oceans, and then more oceans, and then more oceans, and more seas. In other words, we cannot exhaust all of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharing with us, uh, even as much as we try to learn. But one of the things that uh, was very significant in his risala, and the background that he was facing, was the issue of women and children. And this is the area that really I had in mind for this evening it requires a lot of study far beyond what I could ever produce. It takes uh, our scholars and others to, to really exhaust this because they have access to materials in probably languages that are not, the information is not completely available in English. But safe to say that, that during the uh, pre muhammadi period and during his period of time, ladies didn't have any rights at all. The female gender did not have any rights. They didn't have a right to inheritance. They didn't have a right to decide who they would be married to. And these lack of rights was critical in Arabian society, which is why, and I call it one of the soft spots, we should consider all of us today are on the front lines of defending Islam. Every Muslim is, has to defend Islam in these days. There's nothing called, I'm taking a passive role or marginal role, role. even if it's just a word, if it's a poem, if it's an essay, if it's a saying. Because Islam, from day one, has been under attack. As Imam Asi says, the Quran lives in a war zone, always has lived in a war zone. And by saying Quran, obviously Islam is living in a war zone. So one of the soft spots, as I call it, it's a soft spot for them, but it's a strength for us, is the issue of polygamy. Polygamy is one of those areas when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad that 
the enemies of Islam, those people who dislike and attempt to distort Islam, this is an area they try to hit very hard. What do they say? For example, they say that the Prophet وسلم, was a pedophile. And they are trying to attach that claim to him because of his marriage to Aisha, which took place when she was very young. And there are some reasons why that marriage took place and the other 11 marriages that history says he had, at least 11. All of his marriages, we should know clearly from the beginning, had two dimensions. One was to protect the women and the orphans. This is why when the Quran talks about marrying more than one, if a man exercise that, and remember, please keep in mind, I'm not, an advocate, I'm not advocating polygamy here. So I don't want somebody to, to think I'm interested in it or, or, or pushing that concept. I'm just trying to take us back to the dynamics of the culture that he was living in and then bring us up to date so that we can play a role in defending Islam. The current event, for example, just to, I mean, to, to bring things to light, this current event that has occurred overseas and the conversation around freedom of speech is a soft spot. That's one of those areas that every Muslim should know what does Islam say about freedom of speech. We should be clear about that. What is the Islamic principle and value about freedom of speech? That's a spot that we're being hit at. So going back to the issue of polygamy, if a lady's husband passed away or was killed in war, she could not inherit from him. She had no right to inherit. If by chance she was to receive what that husband had of possessions of wealth, by chance she would get it. But there was no legal right that would guarantee that she would get it, and therefore her children, the orphan, wouldn't have anything. This was the norm in the society. Some of the historians say that in that time, if a man had multiple wives, which was a norm, that if the husband died, and say for example he had six wives or three or whatever it was, his son actually could inherit his father's wives, with the exception of his mother. This was a norm. One of the things that you find uh, going back to, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's early marriage to Aisha is that you don't hear anyone criticizing his marriage to her at the age and there's varying uh, statements about what her actual age was. Some of the historians say, say that Aisha was betrothed, meaning promised to him at age six. And some say that the marriage was consummated at age nine. Some say 10, some say later. One scholar even expands the range uh, to perhaps 19. This is a minority opinion of, of one historian. But whether it's 10, 9, or what the idea was in Arabian society is that when a girl reached puberty, she was eligible for marriage. Um, and because lifespan was short at that time, the average lifespan was about 40 years. So you can imagine in today's culture where some uh, male or female says, I'm going to get married after I get my PhD or master's degree or bachelor's degree. They're 25, 26, 22, 28. That means if you would compare that to that time, they would have a marriage of about 12 years if they would live to be 40. So no one at that time criticized his marriage to Aisha at that age. And of course, you didn't have any agency that will issue a birth certificate like we do now. When our children are born, you get a birth certificate that says, yes, your child was born on this day, at this time, in this hospital. They didn't have anything like that. They didn't have police departments. There were no judges verifying things. There was no registry that you would go to to get documentation. And therefore, a lot of the dates associated with some of the early people at that time are acceptable, but not necessarily verifiable because you didn't have the type of agency that were documenting people's ages. But nevertheless, it was a norm in that society for someone to get married uh, very early. And it wasn't just unique to Arabian society. It's been, it's been a practice in Europe. It's been a practice in Asia. It's been a practice in Africa, in many societies. And it even still continues 
to this day that their early marriage uh, is a norm. So what we need to know uh, and to keep in mind is that first, the, the prophet's marriages, and I'm only bringing this subject up as, I, as I'm trying to explain because students who are today in universities or in high school, different places, this, these are the places that the non-Muslim so-called academics and educators, they try to confuse the public by giving them bad information about the prophet in this area. By saying, you see, he had so many wives, he had this, he had that. Well, the history uh, paints a different picture about that. So as I said, the first cause would be to give a legitimacy and family life to the women, the widows, and their children. The second reason why he had multiple uh, marriages was because, I use a phrase, he was a great and the greatest social engineer. The Prophet was an architect in the social arena. He was socially engineering the society and through his marriages with different people, he was creating alliances he was neutralizing enemies. He was holding back hostilities. He was bringing together different groups uh, that had hostility towards him and Islam that through these uh, social engineering and marrying different ladies, he could hold them off. So who would be one? For example, the first lady that he married after Khadija to Kubra, Sayyida Khadija passed away when he was 50 years old, 25 years or so of marriage to her, a loving marriage. She died, as we all know, after three years of being boycotted and eating leaves. That's what they had to eat, unless somebody would sneak them in some food, some bread, or whatever they had, compliments of Khadija's wealth and her influence and the others who had been virtually under house arrest boycotted in that shave or Abbey toilet for three years. She died. When she died, the Prophet Sallallahu still is head of a household. He has children. The argument of whether or not Khadija to Kubra had all of his children versus only Fatima, that's an incidental marginal argument. That's not the issue. He was head of a house. In his house was a lady named Khawla. She was like a housekeeper after Khadija to Kubra died. And Khawla used to look at him and she used to see his sadness and his pain. He never got over Khadija. And she used to say, Ya Rasulullah, you shouldn't live like this. Your life shouldn't be filled with sadness and grief. You should marry. And he asked her, to whom should I marry? She mentioned the name Saudat, or you should marry Aisha. And then he told Khala, why don't you go to Saudat, who was older. Some of the history says she was 40. Some say she was 50. You get varying you know, information depending upon what's read. And so she went to uh, Saudat, Khala, and told her that Muhammad Sallallahu is willing to marry you if you're interested. She herself, Saudat had been among that first group that had migrated to Abyssinia. When the, when the heat and the pressure of Mecca was so tough, the Prophet Sallallahu told some of them, you can leave, go to Abyssinia, because the king there is a good man, and you'll find refuge there, he'll teach you very nice, and go there and stay. And she was one of those who went. Sadly, when she went there, her husband, he abandoned Islam, according to some narrations. He left Islam and became a Christian and he was a drunkard. He went back to drinking and he died. Some of the history say he died in Abyssinia. Some say he died shortly after returning back to Mecca. So the Prophet Sallallahu when the proposal was sent to Saudad that he would be willing to marry her, she being a widow, she said, why don't you, Kaula, speak to my father? Let my father know that Muhammad Salaam Islam is interested in this marriage, which he did. And then the father said, go to my daughter and ask her what does she say? Because the permission to make the, mar the marriage shara'i legal, it has to be approved by the lady. You can't impose the, the marriage on the lady. 
any case, she said, yes, I will marry him. And she was very, very happy. Some of the history says she gave away all of her ornaments, her jewelry, whatever she had. Not like a Melvin Marcos, you know, the lady of the Philippines who had 10,000 pair of shoes. She probably had a, maybe a ring and a necklace or something uh, very insignificant. But whatever it was, the joy and the love in her heart uh, was very grateful. And, of course, she married Muhammad Salah. So the marriage actually recorded to took place in Abyssinia, and the king performed the nikah. And the king was performed by him, and the history says he paid 400 dirhams as her dowry, as her mother, and he also created a feast for the nikah. And then when Saudad came back to Mecca, there was a second feast, uh, and the dirham even increased. Some of the historians said it was 500 dirham that she received, which was sounds like a big number, but I'm sure at that time it wasn't a lot. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always felt like in marrying her, Saudad, and then after her was Aisha, and then he married, and I'm kind of out of order unless I refer to my notes here, but I don't want to bore you with that. But he married Um Habiba, he married two Zainabs, he married Um al he married Hafsa, he married these different ladies, and all of them had their own reason. So the, the last one that I'll mention, um, he married one lady named Juwadiyah. And Juwadiyah was from Najd. And Najd is an area in central Arabia. The mountains to its west, Yemen to its south, it's considered as a plateau. And he married Juwadiyah. Juwadiyah was from a tribe in central Arabia. At that time, it was a robbing tribe. They were bandits. And the Prophet Sallallahu actually launched a raid on them. He launched a raid on them because the caravans that used to go to that region in their buying and selling were caravans that were financing the opposition against the Islamic movement at that time. So the Prophet launched a raid on them. And when he launched a raid on them, and Juarius' father was the chief, and he was also the chief robber. And they would battle. There was war taking place between them. These, this war and these battles are, are mentioned prominently in our Islamic history. Uh, the Prophet, Islam, and al-Mu'minin were able to subdue them. They suppressed them. They defeated them over time. As they defeated them, the Muslims captured some of them and kept them as prisoners treating them well. But what eventually happened after the Prophet ﷺ married Juwadiyah, those Muslims who had been fighting in the Muslim camp and who had captured some of Juwadiyah's people from her tribe, they released them. Because releasing them was again an expression of his social engineering. And by releasing them, those Muslims said, it's no way we can keep a family member of Juwadiyah from that tribe while Muhammad والسلام, is now married to Juwadiyah and he's <coughs> a part of that bigger family. And that was a very significant gesture, so much so that Juwadiyah's tribe and her father's tribe, they, the history says they did not necessarily convert to Islam, but they adopted a posture of accepting the Prophet's authority in Medina and they became, their hostility pretty much uh, vanished. They are, uh, you know, just to conclude, there are many uh, narratives around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his marriages, which were marriages of social engineering to advance the agenda of Islam. Uh, no one can dispute the fact that the ladies that he married, he loved them, they were dear to him. But he always had in his mind that Islamic agenda was more important than just love and uh, what the enemy tried to attack him by saying he was a person of lust, all of these things that we don't want to even mention in a dignified ceremony. Let them keep their, their bad mouth, bad mouthing where they, where they need to keep it. I don't want to tell you where they should take it. If you know, where they should take it. Because Probably what I tell you is that actually should be worse than what I say. So, 
So please, my advice to all of us is, let's take a good look at what I'm calling the soft spots in our Islam, soft spots in their eyes, strong places in our eyes, and try to bulk ourselves up, because Islam obviously is under attack, all of us know that. And that's nothing new. Islam has been under, atta under attack from the very beginning. Every prophet was under attack. Every Muslim has been under attack. Every Muslim who stands for something is under attack. So all of us have to do our part. And there's no, there's no reason for us in these days to feel overwhelmed by saying, you see, the attack is too big and the enemies are too much and Islam is suffering. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the scene. He's in every scene and every picture and every unfolding and every development. And with him, it's not about numbers. It's about quality. It's about ikhlas. It's about sincerity. It's about what's the aim, what's the goal, what's the strategy, where's the humility, where's the ta'awun, where's the cooperation, where's the wa'tasimu bihabdillahi jami'a wa la tafarrahu, where are all of these things uh, in the scene, and therefore, uh, with that in mind, let us all, uh, in this blessed occasion of Mawlid Gun Nabi, uh, dedicate ourselves to furthering the legacy that he left uh, behind for us, which is the legacy of Islam, and the greatest gift. There is no greater gift than Quran. It is the greatest gift that anyone uh, has ever received or will ever receive. Uh, I know it's been a saving grace for all of us here who would feel that way, whether we were both born into an Islamic family or reverted to Islam. We know that there is nothing better than the gift of Islam. And our leader, Muhammad ibn Abdullah Mustafa, sallallahu
Sister Shahnaz has been the principal of the Sunday school. Ever since this masjid opened, mashallah, she has been always active every Sunday teaching our children. For the past 20 years. Gentle care, she felt pain no more. 
she turned around with so much awe on her side as she saw that mercy of all the space and time. Her eyes lit bright as she faced Ahmad with a sparkling light. Then, then she heard a voice with no sight. O oh, Amina, O oh, Amina, mother of the last prophet, your house is the place of our immunity, and we bestow upon you, O oh, Amina, so much prosperity. O oh, Amina, the mother of piety, we have given him the charming voice of David, the love of Daniel, in the piety of Yahya. We have given to your child the manners of Khalid, the words of Ismail, and the beauty of Yusuf in the and the perseverance of Musa in the piety and virtue of Isa. We have given him the charisma of Adam, the power of Nuh, the obedience of Yunus, and the dignity of Isa of Elias and the four perturbations of Ayu. Your child is so unique. Your beloved is so lovely, totally pure, and totally good. And when I was listening to the divine voice almighty, and when I was staring at the sparkling eyes of Muhammad, when she saw, when she saw the heavenly girls, one with bright black pearls, the other with an emerald bucket, and another one a moon flower in her in palm. <coughs> they bathed Muhammad like a white pearl and put the seal of prophethood on his shoulders with the power of Almighty in full. They wrapped him in a sil in a silver satin as the heavenly girls started flying. A bad man, Arab man, put a step in Omar Qara and reached and recited this poem. Oh friends, oh friends, where were you? Were you were you caught in the sea of death last night? Which one of you saw the spark in the sky? Who saw the selfish light of the moon ray? It was the desert, and I was alone, and I saw that the stars were coming to our earth, that the, that the last night the skies sprayed the ray on earth. With the poem of that era, people felt a different change. They started chanting with the poem of the Bedouin man. May your soul be at peace, O oh, the man of the desert. Where are you? Oh, the old man of the desert of O Arab, where are you? Where are you, the wise man of right guidance? To see now that the name of Ahmad is in every step of life. To see in every wave of the voice and the memory, Muhammad is for eternity. Muhammad is for life. Muhammad is for life, like the light of sun. The whole world knows that no name is like him, and nobody under this roof of blue skies matches him. The world will be ruined, and the old sky will be upside down if we see one day that the name of Muhammad is not in the world.